Roger van der Weyden, or Roger van der Weyden, or his French name is Roger de la Pasteur. He's considered to be one of the founders, uh, one of the most influential artists of the early Netherlandish painters. With Jan van Eyck and Roger van der Weyden are considered to be the two um, most significant of the early Netherlandish painters. Um, I should probably tell you what his name means. Uh, Biden would mean something like field or meadow. And you can see that in the French name, Roger de la Pasteur, pasture. But you've got to give me his name in Nederlands, van der Weyden, or if you prefer the French, uh, Roger de la Pasteur. Because of documents that name his age, we think that he was born between 1399 and 1400, right at the turn of the century. And he died in June 1464. We do have some documents about him. Some of them are really subject to interpretation and I'm not going to go through every one of them, but we do know that he was the pupil of Robert Campin in Tournai, uh, the artist that we identify with the master of Flamand. Tournai is what is in today is Belgium. Roger began his apprenticeship with Robert Campin on March 5th, 1426. Well, if the dates that we have for his birth are accurate, that's very late. Usually people would become apprentices in adolescence or as young teenagers, around 14 perhaps. So we don't know why uh, it's so late in his life, unless there is some error about when he was born. We just don't know. We do know also that he became a master on August 1st, 1432. And remember, we talked a little bit about the problems that Robert Campin was having in 1432. Uh, he was sentenced to be, to go on a pilgrimage uh, to Provence, to Saint-Gilles-du-Gard in uh, southern France. And that meant he would have to close down his workshop. And what would happen to all his workers, his apprentices? Well, they could not produce artwork to sell and make a living as apprentices. It had to come out under a master. So several of these artists were evidently already trained. Uh, maybe they were putting off becoming masters because they liked working for campaign or because they were saving up the money for the master fee. But at any rate, when it looked like campaign was going to leave and shut down the workshop, several of his apprentices became masters in their own right in 1432, Roger van der Weyden among them. And as we know, um, there was intervention and uh, Campine did not have to go on his pilgrimage. Roger van der Weyden moved to Brussels and he became the town painter of Brussels. Something else that we know, or believe we know, because it's in uh, a document, uh, is that he visited Rome in 1450. Now, 1450 was the jubilee year. The Pope had called for a jubilee, uh, a celebration uh, in the year 1450. And people who made the journey to Rome, who performed certain prayers uh, with the right attitude, uh, certain uh, went to certain places, could acquire indulgences, which would help to save their souls. Or you can also acquire indulgences for someone else. So certainly Roger van der Weyden might have gone to Rome uh, for the good of his soul, and it might also have been uh, perhaps for his daughter who had died. Uh, and so perhaps you know, he was going to collect some indulgences for her as well. Uh, indulgences essentially were in exchange for 
prayers, actions, say going on pilgrimage, uh, done with the right pious attitude. They would make up for sins. And you would be told you would be at so much time off of purgatory. So we would know he went down to Italy. He died in Brussels in June of 1464, as we said before. Now, the picture you're looking at here is from what we call the Codex Aris. It's a codex, a book in Aris, uh, the town. And it has drawings of famous people. And this is the drawing of Roger van der Weyden. Obviously, the artist is copying probably some kind of portrait. Uh, there's also a page, we'll see it later, uh, of Hieronymus Bosch is portrayed there. Now, why is Roger van der Weyden considered to be one of the founders? What is the quality of his work? Well, let's look at some of the things about his style, and then we'll go a little further uh, with what does he do that's so unusual. He's an artist with a very strong design sense. When you look at works of art by Roger van der Weyden, you'll see that they are beautifully composed. There are usually the repetition of different shapes and lines that make up a unified composition. Sometimes you can look at them and you have these naturalistic, you know, illusionistic figures. And you, you can also, if you sort of try to not think of them as figures, you can also see them almost as beautiful abstract shapes. Which is something, of course, that would appeal to, uh, say, studio artists today. You have that naturalism. There's nothing, you know, abstract about the figures. But there is this wonderful quality of design. His later work becomes much more elongated. But even in his earlier work, you have these elegant figures, beautiful poses. Now, there's a very famous quotation from Max J. Friedlander. I guess I should tell you who Max J. Friedlander is first. He is um, known as the great connoisseur of early Netherlandish painting. Most of these artists did not sign their names to the painting. If they did sign it, it would have been on the frame, and many times the frames are lost. We've talked about paintings by Jan van Eyck that still have their frame and still have a name on it. But you had a lot of these paintings from the 15th century in the lowlands. And Max J. Friedlander was one of the people who looked at the artwork and divided it into artists, essentially. Um, and he's the person who very frequently would attribute paintings to a particular artist or to a group that was related to an artist and sometimes would uh, you know, we would have works of art by someone, but we don't know their name. So they become the master of something. So we call him, you know, a connoisseur. You know, he is uh, the person who first, I guess, organized uh, early Netherlandish painting and made some really good ideas about who painted what. But since then, sometimes we disagree with him. But um, you know, he was uh, one of the major art historians in uh, early Netherlandish painting. In fact, he wrote a multi-volume book called Alter Nederlandish Malerei, Early Netherlandish Painting. Now, one of the quotations from this book is that Jan van Eyck was an explorer. Roger van der Weyden was an inventor. Now, what does that mean? Well, in a sense, Jan van Eyck explores the visible world and recreates it in his paintings with you know, those incredible textures and naturalistic details. Now, in general, early Netherlandish artists do use naturalistic details. Jan van Eyck goes further and more believably, perhaps, than anyone else. You'll see Roger also uh, does you know, beautiful textures. 
But also, one of the things that Roger van der Weyden did was invent compositions, gestures that help tell the story or help tell uh, the ideas behind the painting. And if you are an artist who is maybe not as skilled as Jan van Eyck or as skilled as Roger van der Weyden, would it be easier to copy the technique uh, and the, the naturalistic detail and the luminosity of Jan van Eyck? Or would it be easier to copy a composition or copy gestures? So Roger van der Weyden invented compositions and gestures that other artists then copied and adapted. So he became extremely influential. And if you're saying, well, how could they do that? Remember, there's no copyright laws. Um, an artist could choose to copy someone else. Now, very frequently, the reason they do that is because the way they are trained in the workshop is by copying their master's work. And then the most inventive of them, the most um, talented of them, will change those things. They will develop their own style. But, you know, other artists just continue to copy, in a sense. Uh, and they, you know, may have been trained on their artist's they may have been trained on their master's patterns. We believe that the we talk about pattern books. They don't have to be books. They could be a chest. They could be a um, box. But we believe that the artist kept the patterns of the compositions that they made and reused them, of course, and that also the students uh, would often copy these and create their own uh, patterns that then they could use later. Other artists could just go and they see a work of art. It's in a public place. It's in the guild hall or a church. Uh, and they also can copy that. And it's even possible that a patron could say, well, you know, I want this picture to look like you know, so-and-so, Roger van der Weyden's painting, but um, I don't want to pay Roger's prices or he's too busy or, or maybe it's after his death. Uh, people copied Roger van der Weyden. Also, Roger van der Weyden has this incredibly strong emotional content. Uh, in an exhibition of Roger van der Weyden's work, they called him the master of the passions. Particularly the passion of Christ. And the word passion uh, comes from passio, and it means the suffering, the suffering of Christ. And so he shows how Christ suffered, he shows how his mother suffered, he shows how the followers of Christ suffered. And it makes a very strong emotional impact on the viewer. This is the first work we're going to look at by Roger van der Weyden. As you can see, um, we don't know the exact date. Uh, there's no paintings by Roger van der Weyden that have a date on them. Uh, but because of stylistic development, as remember I said that uh, his later work becomes more elongated and even more elegant, um, there are some roughly agreed upon <laughs> uh, chronologies. Sometimes we do argue about them, I should tell you. Uh, but this one is usually considered early in his career, uh, not too long after he left the workshop of Robert Campine. Uh, there are even, there was even uh, some people, uh, Frinta, for example, who thinks that it's painted partially by Campine and partially by Roger van der Weyden. Um, my own opinion is that it is much more Roger van der Weyden. Um, I don't see Campine in this at all. Um, and so we're dating it around 1435. Now, I said that people copied his painting. And there are many copies of this. I'm showing you some of the early, well, I'm showing you an early copy, uh, which is dated. The Idle Hair Triptych in Louvain, and it's dated 1443. So we know that Roger's painter painting had to be painted before that date. And then I'm also showing you an engraved copy 
much later, 1565, by Cornelius Court. There are also 16th century copies that reproduce it you know, very closely. So people were copying this painting uh, well over a hundred years later. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to show you this engraving, and you can see the engraving has uh, reversed the, the, the arrangement of the figures. Uh, undoubtedly, the drawing that was made for the engraving you know, was a copy. And instead of reversing it before they engraved it, they just engraved it that, that, that way. And so when you print it, it comes out a reverse. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this is because this is the only document that we have for attributing paintings to Roger van der Weyden. The inscription, you can see it here, M, presumably for Master, Roger of Belgium, uh, in Latin, of course, uh, invented, invented this. And so it's naming Roger of Belgium as the inventor. Now we have the painting that it copies. And so we look at that painting and we, we say this is by Roger. And we have Roger van der Weyden mentioned in documents and tournée. Uh, we also have von der Weyden, uh, von der Weyden sometimes called the Vasari of the North. Uh, he, the very first years of the 17th century, about 1601, 1604, uh, he publishes a book called Het Schilderbook, the Book of Painters. And he talks about Roger as well, only he thinks he's two people. He talks about Roger of Brussels and Roger of Bruges. What we think is that he may have seen some pictures in Bruges by Roger van der Weyden and just assumed they were you know, from two different places. Um, okay, let's go back and look at Roger's painting. This painting uh, is known as the Deposition, which comes from the Latin word deposito, uh, but it's more usually called the Descent from the Cross, which is the name that we give to paintings of Christ being taken down from the cross. They took him from the cross and laid him in the tomb, says the Gospels. of this was the Archer's Guild. And if you look in the corners, the, up, uh, the upper left and right corners of the, the main part of the image, uh, you see Gothic tracery that looks a little bit like a crossbow. So this was for the chapel of the Archer's Guild in the church of Notre Dame in Louvain. So said we usually call it the descent from the cross. Now, compositionally, you'll notice that it looks almost like these figures are in a little golden box. So the space is compressed. Of course, it's on a flat panel. But you have this impression of three-dimensional figures, as I said, almost compressed into uh, this, this little uh, space box. And you have a number of very angular shapes, as well as some curving forms. But you can see, of course, that uh, all of the, the bottom of the draperies break up into little angular folds. Um, the figure of Mary Magdalene, we'll take a look at this closer. Um, but here you can see she's the figure on the far right as you look at the picture. and. Her hand, she's wringing her hands, and her back elbow seems to be upward uh, rather than extending backward, as though she doesn't have really enough space. Uh, and that makes it more tense. Uh, the feeling of suffering is increased. You also have this beautiful rhythmic composition with the repetition of different shapes and forms. So, 
for example, looking at Mary Magdalene's skirt. It's got all of these angular forms, but the basic uh, bottom of her skirt sort of forms a curving line that takes us right up to uh, the hem of Nicodemus's garment. And if you look at uh, the the gold brocade garment over his uh, his lower garment, it once again it has a kind of curving form that repeats that shape. Uh, and Mary is repeating that shape. Uh, the the cloth with which uh, they are holding Christ has a, right below his knee. There's a kind of curving shape that repeats that. And so you go on through the composition with uh, both curving and angular forms. You can see that Christ and Mary are held in exactly the same positions. So there's the repetition of the form. And we'll talk about the meaning of that shortly. Mary Magdalene her body arcs around, and then on the far left, there's St. John leaning down, St. John the Evangelist leaning down uh, to help support Mary. And both of them form kind of parentheses around the main figures, Mary and Christ, uh, around the whole composition. Now, I promise to explain why these figures have um, the same pose. Obviously, compositionally, it works very, very well. You know, you're repeating the same form, you're emphasizing the suffering, but does it go further than that? Yes, it does. Uh, there's a very famous article by Otto von Simpson. And you know, we talked about how art historians sometimes disagree well, this is an article that has held its uh, content. Um, no one has disagreed with it. It has the sources from the theologians. It has uh, the relationship to the time in which it is in. And it's also that the painting itself, obviously the painting speaks to us. If you know about some of the theological background, you would look at this and you would immediately see the parallel between Mary and Christ. So what's going on in theology? Well, Mary's compassion was well known. And the word compassion comes from the Latin co passio. Passio, passion, means to suffer. Co means with. So to suffer with, that's what compassion is, when someone suffers with someone else. And it was said that Mary suffered in her heart, or Mary suffered in her soul, just as much as Christ suffered in his body. When she saw her son with such pain and such suffering, she felt the same thing. Now, when you see images of Mary in crucifixion scenes, for example, this would be the event just before the taking down of the cross, Christ on the cross uh, with Mary and John and the followers of Christ on one side and the tormentors on the other. There's two ways that Mary is shown. Traditionally, in many paintings, she's shown standing with her hands clasped. She's the Stabat Mater, the standing mother. And of course, there is a medieval hymn that is still sung today called the Stabat Mater. Mary stands erect under the cross, erect in her faith. But in the later Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, there was such emphasis on the suffering of Christ and the suffering of Mary reminding you that, you know, Christ died for you. His mother suffered with him. And there was such emphasis in the devotions on what we would call imagining yourself to be with Mary and Christ. Uh, they wouldn't have said imagining. Um, the phrase that Ludolf of Saxony uses is to be present by thought. So in some way, you know, you can share the life of Christ or the life of Mary. Uh, 
you're supposed to feel the suffering. Now, when the Duke saw a painting of Christ's suffering, he is supposed to have wept. It shows his piety. Here you see Mary collapsing. And that was what, in the later Middle Ages, they started to show. Mary was suffering so much she could no longer stand. She would swoon. Yes, what is swoon? The counter, uh, swooning, when you faint away, it's what Shakespeare calls the counterfeit of death. It looks like you're dead, but you're not really. And so here we see Mary, she has been so overcome with her pain and her grief as she sees her son dying on the cross that she has simply fainted. She's swooning. And she's held in the same position that Christ is. So it's an absolute parallel. So we can go further with Mary's compassion. And it was widely believed, it's not a doctrine of the church, although I understand that there is a movement today in the 21st century uh, to declare this a doctrine of the church, but it has not yet been. But it was widely believed, and the theologians um, expressed this idea that Mary was a co-redeemer, that she participated in the salvation of mankind. Well, let me go a little further with that idea. How did Mary participate in the salvation of mankind? Well, in one way, I think all Christians would agree with this, by bearing the Christ child. But if you, know, you believe that Christ had to come into the world and suffer uh, as a human being in order to atone for the sins of mankind, then if he couldn't be born, then he couldn't become man. Um, so Mary, as the God-bearer, helps bring Jesus into the world. Okay. But the belief about her as a co-redeemer goes further than that. And I need to explain something called uh, the Treasury of Merits. It's a kind of analogy that is used to explain how people can be saved by the merits, as they call them, of Christ. And so imagine yourself that there's a kind of bank with all of the suffering that Christ did, which was totally undeserved, makes merits for the souls of mankind. And so all these, this suffering and the merits that are created are all in this treasury. And you know, you're a, a dying, devout Christian. Uh, you can call upon the merits of Christ to help save your soul. Now, Christ's merits were enough to save the entire world. And can draw these merits out of the treasury of merits. However, some of the medieval theologians thought about people like the saints. Um, yeah, they weren't perfect. They were human. They had original sin. But some of them suffered so horribly, it was certainly more than they ever deserved. So the extra suffering, if you will, could also be deposited in the treasury of merits. It's not necessary for the salvation of mankind, but it's like, you got extra. <laughs> and then, of course, there was Mary. She suffered in her soul, in her heart. And all of that suffering was undeserved. By this time, Mary was thought of as you know, a, a, a sinless being. In fact, during the 15th century, uh, the idea of the immaculate conception of the Virgin was growing. Uh, the idea that she, alone of all fully human beings, was given a kind of dispensation by God that she was not born with original sin. And so all of the suffering was undeserved. So we can put that in the treasury of merits. And you can draw upon that suffering, uh, those merits that are created by Christ, the Virgin, the saints. As I say, Christ, enough merits for everybody. So this, is, this is extra, but she can help participate in the salvation of mankind. 
Now there's something else about this painting that is unique. We see here tears, and I'm showing you details of Mary and of Nicodemus, and you see their eyes are just overflowing with tears, with water, which is then dripping down their face. Panofsky called these the first tears in the history of art. Now, we don't have every work of art that was ever created, so I mean, it's possible that some Roman painter painted tears, but we don't have the work, and we don't have someone telling us that he did it. You may remember uh, Robert Campine's Sarah Lynn entombment in the Courthold Institute in uh, London that we talked about previously. And it has an angel wiping his eyes, you know, weeping, presumably. When I went to the Courthold, one of the things I was looking for was to see if there were tears on Robert Campine's angel, and there were not. So as far as I know, Panofsky's right. These are the first known tears in the history of art. So I want to look at some more details. Uh, here you see a detail of Mary weeping. You can see the tears, beautiful tears, these beautiful teardrop-shaped tear tears, naturally, uh, transparent and you know, dripping down her face and, and literally dripping off her chin. Before she swooned, she has wept. And here you see parallels of the hand of Christ with the blood that was um, coming from the wound. And of course, it would have dripped down as it was hanging from the cross. And now that the hand is, is um, falling downward toward the ground uh, where the, you know, the you can see some of the blood that's still wet is, is coming downward. So you have um, you know, beautiful shapes of the blood. And the blood forms kind of teardrop shapes as well. Here, Nicodemus. Uh, sometimes people say, well, how do you know this is Nicodemus? And, you know, that's always a kind of trick. You know that both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were supposed to have um, traditionally been laying Christ in the tomb. Uh, sometimes one of the figures will have very rich garment and you'll say, oh, yeah, that must be Joseph of Arimathea because he was uh, a wealthy man. He's the one who gave Christ, who gave Christ a tomb. He gave his own tomb that Christ could be buried. Joseph of Arimathea. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And unlike most of the Pharisee, he was a follower of Christ. Now, in this case, the man has a very rich garment. So we can't really say on the basis of who has the richer garment, which one would be Joseph of Arimathea. But traditionally, Joseph of Arimathea holds the head of Christ and Nicodemus is closer to the feet. Here he's holding up uh, the knees, actually. Um, and so traditionally we see a man at the head of Christ and he's Joseph of Arimathea and the one uh, nearer the feet of Christ uh, is Nicodemus. You'll also notice how realistic that face is. And it has been suggested, we have no way of knowing this, that it's possible that you know, one of the patrons, maybe one of the officers of the Archers Guild, uh, had himself painted as one of the mourners. And when we look at the whole image again, you're going to see there is another man standing behind who you know, we don't have a name for. And so it's been suggested that maybe he is also uh, one of the, uh, say, guild leaders or someone who... Uh, could be portrayed here as one of the followers of Christ, what I call sacred impersonation. And I, I think, I gave a paper on this at CCAC last year, um, I think it relates to the idea of imitation of the saints. We talk a lot about the imitation of Christ, but there also was the idea of imitating the saints. 
And uh, Ludolf of Saxony has some prayers in which he says things like, Lord, make of me a Joseph of Arimathea, or make me like the holy women. Now, do we know that that's actually a portrait of somebody? No. It could simply be that Roger has painted an extremely realistic image, maybe after a model. So we don't know that. It's, you know, maybe it's a possibility. And then you have one of the holy women weeping, wiping her face. And then you have Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene traditionally is shown as the most emotive of all of the followers at the lamentation over the body of Christ. You know, she, um, and at the passion of Christ. Uh, she has various poses that are used in different works of art where uh, you know, she's crying out here. She is wringing her hands and bowed down with grief. And here we see the face of Christ dead as he's taken down from the cross. We see the blood that has dripped down from the wound. And you can see it, it cascades in a very beautiful, elegant, curving line. It's a detail of the hand. And you can see that the blood is also the shape of the teardrops at the very base of where the, uh, the blood has streamed down. More details. And here you can see that man, uh, he seems to be holding uh, Mary Magdalene's unguent jar. Uh, once again, could he be a patron? You know, we don't have a name uh, to uh, put on him of one of the figures who would normally be at a deposition. And here, uh, evidently, a, a servant, someone who's helping uh, lower Christ to the arms of, presumably, Joseph of Arimathea. Now, I wanted to say just a little bit more about some of the uh, what cultural parallels that we find to this work of art. We talked about the emotive impact of compressing the figures into a very shallow space. But why did he do that? And there's a couple of ideas about this. One is the relationship to medieval theater, which were sacred dramas. And sometimes they would form what we call a tableau vivant, a living painting. And the actors would take the poses and you know freeze for a little while uh, to show the scene, say, of the suffering of Christ or the crucifixion of Christ or whatever the, the story that was being shown. And so it's been suggested that this is a kind of tableau vivant. Only it really is a painting. The other idea is that this very much resembles a schnitzalter. Okay, what's that mean? Um, it's a carved wooden altarpiece. Many of the northern altarpieces were not painted in the center, but they would have carved figures. And then they might have uh, carved wings, or they might have um, painted wings that could fold over them. So you would have a kind of box that was created. Uh, and then you would have the carved wooden figures of the sacred drama placed within it, carved within it, uh, and then they would be painted. Now, the sculptor normally did not paint them. Normally, you would have the sculptor would create the, uh, the altarpiece, uh, carving it, if it's a wooden, carved wooden altarpiece, and then a painter would be hired to paint because that was a specialized trade, specialized craft. But the idea was to make these figures look lifelike. You can almost think of them as kind of sacred dioramas, if you will. Um, but here we see what looks almost like the little space box that you would find uh, for a carved altarpiece, but it's as though the figures in it came to life. 
they don't look like wooden figures that have been painted. Or some of the ones I got interested in are clay figures you know, that have been painted. Um, they look like the statues have come to life. And so maybe, you know, he was playing off the idea of um, different ways of showing in different media the suffering of Christ and the compassion of Mary. Now, this was very influential. As I told you, there's some 16th century paintings that just copy it. There's, of course, that engraving. There's that early uh, copy. Um, this is a drawing, not by Roger van der Weyden, but we think that it copies a lost painting of the Lamentation by Roger van der Weyden. We don't have every work of art that these people created. Sometimes we have very few works. I mean, they, they had a whole career. Uh, but over time, many of the works of art have been destroyed, and we call them lost paintings. And this just follows Roger's style so completely. You can see that the figure of Mary Magdalene, with her uh, very characteristic gesture, uh, has uh, followed what Roger had done with his other uh, painting, the one we just saw, The Descent from the Cross. Uh, but here it's as though they're carrying Christ to the tomb. In fact, it's almost like it's the next event. He's taken down from the cross, uh, and then the Bible says he's laid in the tomb. And Christians um, you know, couldn't imagine that there wouldn't be a lamentation, a mourning over the body. Well, of course, there was a, a reason that they follow so quickly putting the body in the tomb. Uh, it was the approach of the Sabbath at sunset on Friday the Jewish Sabbath begins. And all these followers of Christ, and Christ himself and Mary, they were all Jewish. They wanted to follow the rules. And you are not allowed to bury bodies on the Sabbath. And it breaks the Sabbath. So they had to get him into the tomb before sunset. And then, after the Sabbath, on Sunday morning, uh, the holy women come to anoint the body and find that it is no longer there. Well, here, they're carrying Christ to the tomb, but they are lamenting. And because, you know, Christians didn't have that taboo, uh, they didn't think of, they didn't know, oftentimes know the Jewish law, um, you know, they felt that there should definitely be a, a period of, of mourning. And certainly we see that here. Now, there is a sculpture, carved wooden sculpture, uh, that repeats this design. And so it wasn't just painters that were copying Roger van der Weyden. It was also uh, sculptors. Okay. We're going to go back just a little bit and take a look at a uh, painting by Roger van der Weyden. It's a very small painting. Uh, it's considered to be one of the earliest paintings that we have by Roger van der Weyden, uh, perhaps the earliest. Uh, it is often dated uh, just slightly before the descent from the cross, and it would be used for private devotions because it's you know very small and very precious. Uh, someone could have it for his, their own, his or her own personal use. Uh, today, it's in the Kunstschorsche Museum in Vienna. They think it's very early because the face is still similar to the ones that they see in paintings associated with Robert Campine. So they think this is, you know, right after he left the workshop. Uh, you can see the draperies are rather graceful and beautiful. And you also will see that use of typology, which we've you know we've seen before with Roger van der Weyden. We've seen before with uh, Jan van Eyck, for example, uh, Robert Campine, Roger van der Weyden, uh, where you're relating the incarnation of Christ to Adam and Eve's sin. You know, the incarnate Christ here, shown as baby is the new Adam who redeems the sin of the old Adam or the first Adam. And so we have uh, Adam and Eve portrayed uh, on the archway 
with you know, Christ uh, nursing from his mother's breast. Now, we've already talked about that idea of uh, nursing, being uh, nurturing, uh, and also the idea of having a kind of intercessory connotation. Remember Mary showing her breast at the last judgment and saying, you know, save another sinner for me. I nursed you, you know, your mother. Um, we can see that Mary's not seated on a throne, but she's crowned. And she's standing in front of a cloth of honor and what appears to be a throne. And there are the little lions carved on the edge, you know, which seem to remind us of the idea of her as the throne of wisdom. And of course, crowned with a throne, she's also the queen of heaven. Here is a painting of the Annunciation by Roger van der Weyden. And, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting. Uh, you might think about comparing that to uh, the Annunciations that we associate with the Campine group. So I don't need to repeat what the Annunciation was. The angel Gabriel has come to announce to Mary that she will bear the Christ child. And Roger like the Moroda master or Campine, uh, is showing the event taking place in a domestic interior, sort of the bedchamber of the Virgin. Uh, you can see the bed behind Mary. Mary is reading, presumably from the Bible, presumably a virgin shall conceive and bear a child from Isaiah. It's a very well-furnished room um, with beautiful tiles on the floor, um, very substantial pieces of furniture, one of these settles uh, right up against the fire. And, uh, you know, the fire is, is gone. Uh, evidently, this March is warm enough that she doesn't need to have a uh, fire in the fireplace. So uh, it has been enclosed off and the settle has been pushed up against it. And there's, you know, with a little chest in the background. And we can look out a window and see a little landscape. And we also have the shutters on the right uh, from another open window. There is the angel Gabriel. Like Jan van Eyck's angels, he's wearing, uh, you know, a beautiful uh, cloak, a cope, uh, and the uh, alb is the white garment. So he's wearing liturgical garments, as uh, we'll see Roger van der Weyden does this uh, very frequently, uh, shows angels with liturgical garments. Uh, you know, rich, the beautiful pattern of the uh, brocade and gold stitching. And we also have some of those little interesting details that we see all over the place. Uh, the little lions on the settle, you know, does this refer once again to the throne of wisdom? Uh, we also see right next to the fireplace on the little uh, shelf there, the clear bottle of presumably water, clear vessel. We saw vessels that looked like that in works by Jan van Eyck. We believe that that refers to the purity of the Virgin. We also see some fruit there. Uh, the fruit might refer to the miraculous fecundity or fruitfulness of the virgin, that a virgin can have a child. Uh, or perhaps it could refer to the forbidden fruit uh, and that the fruit uh, of Mary's womb will counteract that act of taking the forbidden fruit. There's more details where you can see the brooch. You can see some of the stitching and the light reflecting off of them. Uh, some of the jewels on the angel's garment. And you know, here's an interesting comparison between Roger van der Weyden and um, Campine, or if you prefer the Moroda master, uh, but by someone associated with uh, the Campine's workshop, perhaps, or a follower thereafter. Uh, at any rate, when we compare these two paintings, we can see uh, certainly differences uh, with Roger van der Weyden's work. Uh, the figures are more slender 
even at this early stage. Um, the space seems to be more believable. In the Maroda altarpiece, uh, the floor seems to tip up. So does the tabletop tip up, uh, and uh, the bench and uh, the edge of the the, well, the walls, uh, you know, seem to uh, recede at a very steep angle. But when we look at Roger Vandervine's, it's it's harmonious. He is able to show you a believable space. There's not uh, any of that uh, sort of archaic uh, quality about it. And if this is Campine, you know, we talk about the very fleshy, earthy face uh, of the uh, from the Campine group. Uh, the face that Roger Vandervine shows, this frontal view, is you know is very similar in some of the proportions, but it's a daintier face with the you know, tinier features in the ovoid face. So there's a relationship, but Roger's own personal style is coming through. Now. Panofsky talks about this because, of course, he believes that uh, the Moroto altarpiece is by Campine. So, if we accept that for a moment, uh, you know, he looks at these two pictures that are created, both by the uh, Campine and uh, Roger van der Weyden. They really look like they had the same model, <laughs> and it's quite possible they did because, of course, these, uh, you know, if uh, Roger van der Weyden was in Campine's workshop or if these uh, items were you know, turned out uh, by an artisan uh, with the same design over and over. Uh, but uh, certainly we could have you know, a very similar, or in this case, probably an identical picture. Um, Panofsky feels that the picture that is in the Campine painting is made up of particular parts, and they're not completely unified. So he's you know, really observed all the little pieces and put them together. And with Roger van der Weyden, he feels with the lighting uh, and the way that the picture is created has a kind of unified concept. And that is one of the things that he points out, you know, that Roger is going um, beyond what um, Campin did. Now we want to look at another work by Roger van der Weyden, or Roger van der Weyden. And this particular painting was another work that was much copied. I'll show you some of the copies also. It's a painting of St. Luke drawing the Virgin Mary. It's now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And I do emphasize that drawing a little bit, and I'm going to tell you why. There's a lot of paintings of St. Luke painting the Virgin. And we want to talk to you about why he may be drawing the Virgin. Now, who's St. Luke and why is he drawing the Virgin? Well, St. Luke was um, the author of, well, St. Luke was the traditional author of the third gospel known as the Gospel of St. Luke. He is supposed to have been a physician of the first century. And there is a legend that the Virgin Mary appeared to him and he painted her portrait. So he also is considered to be a patron saint, both for physicians and for painters. And now who was part of which guild does vary sometimes from city and town, but very, very frequently, and including in Bruges and Brussels, apothecaries and physicians were all in the same guild, the guild of St. Luke, because he's the patron saint for both painters and physicians. And I suppose you could also think of them as kind of chemical workers. Uh, at least the apothecaries and the painters have to grind what pigments or uh, uh, various uh, substances to make uh, medicines. Um, physicians at that this day, of course, uh, did a lot of things like cast your horoscope and examine your urine, uh, not uh, perhaps what we would consider the thing a physician should be doing. But they shared a guild, the Guild of St. Luke. Now, we said that the legend was that St. Luke painted a portrait of the Virgin Mary. And here we see Roger van der Weyden having St. Luke 
drawing her portrait in a particular technique called silver point. Silver point is a very painstaking way to draw. You can't erase. <laughs> You've got to be perfect the first time. Uh, it is very precise. You have a specially coated piece of paper and you have a stylus that has literally a silver point. And you draw on this paper and the silver that's deposited on the paper or on the coating oxidizes and then you can see the picture. Now, why would drawing be showing? Well, this is workshop practice. You know, today, when we think of somebody wants to have a portrait painted, they will come and they will sit for the artist. And we think about them sitting there for hours and hours as the artist paints away. And they'll say, oh, no, don't, don't move, don't talk. We've got to get that mouth just right. Or, you know, hey, you're fidgeting. You get back to that position you were in in the first place. Um, there were periods of time when the artist would have a sitter. But in the 15th century, particularly in the North, they still thought of artists as artisans, not as geniuses that could command uh, important people uh, to sit for them. <laughs> so an important person would not want to just sit there while the artisan paints the entire painting. That important person would have what other things to do. So when you commissioned your portrait, you would sit for the drawing, which would take much less time than painting the whole painting. And the artist would make a very detailed drawing. We have one of these, remember? Well, Jan van Eyck, the Cardinal Albergati. And we said that Jan van Eyck had left color notes on it and used that painting to create, uh, used that drawing to create his painting. So that seems to be what uh, St. Luke is doing here. He's doing the drawing. We can do the painting later. And you can see, uh, just see a little bit into his workshop right behind him on the right. Um, I don't know if you can make it out, but there is the head of an ox. And the reason for that is because um, the ox was considered to be a symbol of St. Luke. All of the four apostles had their symbols. Uh, they come from the four living creatures in the book of Revelation. Um, and you have uh, the winged man for Matthew, the winged ox for Luke, uh, the winged lion for Mark. I should have done Mark first. Matthew, Mark, the lion, uh, Luke, the ox, and John, the eagle. So his symbol or the animal associated with him is just shown there. To, just in case you didn't know who it was, I guess. Now, one of the ideas uh, that has been expressed about this is, could this be a self-portrait of Roger von der Weyden? It's one of those sacred impersonations uh, where, you know, he is showing his devotion to the, to the saint. You know, he's showing he wants to be like the saint. Um, we can pair it with that drawing in the Codex Aris, which is not a totally skilled drawing. It, it does look uh, a bit labored. And you can see there are some similarities in the shape of the head and the chin. The mouth is a fuller mouth with the Codex Aris. And the nose is a, a little bit more alkaline uh, than the St. Luke's, which you know, is a little straighter. Um, so there, there's some differences too. But we don't know how closely the artist of the Codex Aris uh, captured the likeness of Roger van der Weyden. So it has been suggested that this may be another sacred impersonation, that St. Luke is a, a self-portrait. And we know that artists did that. Uh, they sometimes would show themselves as, uh, the, the, give the features of St. Luke, uh, looked a bit like their own features. Okay, now, what was the function of this painting? Remember, he was the town painter of Brussels, so very prominent in Brussels. 
also, as we'll show you in a minute, this painting was copied repeatedly. We have a number of copies even today. Uh, and so it was probably in a public place where the artist could easily see it. And so, I might say a worthy speculation, you know, we can't prove it. We, we do think that this quite possibly was the altarpiece for the Guild of St. Luke, the Physicians, Apothecaries, and Painters Guild. You know, he would be the leader, leading artist in Brussels. So for the Brussels Painters Guild, presumably the leading artist is going to paint their altarpiece. Do you remember seeing the Roland Madonna by Jan van Eyck? Did you realize when you looked at this? You may have. You may have said, Did that, doesn't that remind me of something? Doesn't that remind me of Jan van Eyck's Roland Madonna? Well, even the great artists can borrow from each other. And as you can see, Roger has changed things that he's used. But the basic loggia with the tiled floor and columns that create three openings out to a beautiful landscape. You know, those are similar. The details are different. We don't have the uh, carved capitals that Jan van Eyck had. Uh, and of course, instead of having archways, uh, Roger van der Weyden simply has a lintel going across the uh, top of the opening. But um, they're in a what, similar uh, loggia. And you look out into a garden, and then beyond there is a crenellated wall with two figures looking over the wall at a landscape that has a river and then the two banks. Now, the buildings that are on the banks of the river in uh, Roger van der Weyden's painting are totally different than the ones in Jan van Eyck's. Um, maybe he was trying to show actual places, but we, we don't know that. Also, instead of the two men that we see looking out over the parapet in uh, Jan van Eyck's painting, we see a man and a woman. And it's often suggested that these represent the parents of the Virgin Mary, St. Anne and Joachim. Uh, and the parents of the Virgin Mary, if you say, well, where are they coming from? They are from the Proto-Evangelium, again, this apocryphal gospel that tells uh, both the uh, story of the earlier years of Mary and her parents and how she was conceived, uh, as well as uh, some uh, interesting ideas about the childhood of Christ. I told you this painting was copied many, many times. There's a copy in Munich, another one in Bruges. Uh, there's one that's been cut down a little bit. It's in St. Petersburg in the Hermitage. Um, and it used to be thought some years ago that the Boston painting was a copy after Jan van... Uh, it was a, the Boston painting was a copy after Roger van der Weyden's St. Luke. And if we had the original, most people thought it was the one from Munich. Well, a couple of things happened. I'll talk to you about that. Um, they did infrared, well, first they cleaned the St. Luke and took out overpaint and dirt that was obscuring the surface. And they also uh, did a number of technical examinations. Um, and they looked at this painting using infrared reflectography. And they found what we call pentamenti. Now the word, now you know we use a lot of words from different languages. This is from Italian. Pentamenti means thoughts. So you could think of it as kind of the first thoughts because we use that word to mean changes in the underdrawing. Uh, that when he painted this painting, he changed a lot of things. Here you're looking at the picture of St. Luke. You can see the eyes. You see the eyes where they're painted, but you will see down below them, you can see uh, the underdrawn eyes are a bit lower. And so the ear is lower. So he's sort of changed the position of the face. You generally don't find pentamenti or changes in the underdrawing to the surface, the underdrawing to the surface um, in paintings of uh, that are copies, because the copyist is, you know, he's got it all exactly. He just, you know, copies 
what has already been done. He has to make up his mind about it. But there are many pentimenti or changes in this painting. In fact, under the Christ child, the Christ child's position and Mary's hands position was changed a number of times. And uh, so you can see here a, a, a what they have done is um, drawn the various underdrawings, you know, in a darker ink so that people can actually see them because they're so confusing. There's, you know, many, many, many changes about where the position of the arm of the child is, uh, where Mary's hand is placed, how the Christ child's feet were placed. You see he was lower down for one thing. The arms were uh, slightly different. And, you know, all those changes you know, show the creative process. They show the artist, um, you know, I'm going to put the Christ child here. No, I, I don't think I'll move him. I, I think I'll change this. Yeah. Um, as he's, you know, working out his final composition. Incidentally, that detail that I'm showing you of the nursing virgin and child is a much repeated motif in early Netherlandish art. So uh, even when you weren't painting a St. Luke, you sometimes might borrow the part of the composition. Just a few more details. At the edge of Mary's bench, uh, there is a carving of the fall of man. Uh, and you might notice that the serpent has a female head, and she's wearing one of those horned headdresses. You may remember um, um, Mrs. Arnold Feeney uh, wearing one of those headdresses where her uh, what they would have would be uh, a foundation. It could be cloth, it could be wire or something that they could put the uh, hair up over. And they sometimes call that a horned uh, hairdo or horned headdress. Uh, so the serpent is not wearing actual horns, but the fashionable hairstyle. Uh, and it has a female face. It was generally believed that women were more evil than men because Eve was the first to take the forbidden fruit. She's the first to be, disobey God. Now, you have to remember who is writing these. It's, it's the men, uh, the theologians, and uh, some of them monks, and uh, think of women as basically temptation and uh, you know don't want to have too much to do with them. Um, so they have a very negative view of women. Um, in more modern times, we think of this perhaps a little differently. Uh, Eve and Adam were both supposed to be purely naive individuals, like a child. They did not know good and evil. And so when the serpent, who is representing the devil, was a representation of the devil, uh, comes to Eve, she has no defenses. She says, oh, maybe you're lying to me, or I, I don't know, whatever. She doesn't know that. So she's a totally naive being up against the father of lies. So uh, when Eve offers the fruit to Adam, he's just up, up against another human being like himself. Well, that's not how they interpreted it. Uh, they interpreted it as Eve being the greater sinner. And Mary is often considered to be the you know, antithesis of Eve. She is the new Eve, the, the one who is born without original sin, uh, who uh, never disobeys God and brings the Savior into the world in her womb. Uh, you also see the view through the window with this you know, wonderful view of a, a 15th century Netherlandish town that houses all uh, close together. You can see people drying their clothes through the window, people walking down the street or riding down the street. This is the Muri Flores altarpiece. Uh, it is in Berlin by Roger van der Weyden. Uh, we think it dates about 1440 to 1444. And there's another version. It's in Granada for two of the, uh, in Spain, uh, two of the panels. And the third one is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Now, for many, many years, these were both thought to be by Roger van der Weyden and his workshop.
and then they were subjected to dendrochronology. Um, you know, Peter Klein looked at the tree ring dating of the panels. And the one he had access to was the one in the Metropolitan Museum. And also, uh, you know, you have the panels here in Berlin, uh, which he really would have had access to, that of uh, Hamburg uh, at the uh, Kunstinstitut, the Wood Institute in Hamburg. Uh, so, you know, he examined when these boards on which the paintings are painted were created. And he found out that the paintings that were divided between Granada and New York today were actually created years after Roger van der Weyden died. What he does, of course, is decide, um, he has to make an estimate because you don't have all of the rings of the tree. You have to an estimate of how much of the sap wood, the outer rim of the wood, has been cut off. And then you, you know, try to find um, in their master chronologies of when the tree rings match uh, particular years. And then he makes an estimate of how long it would be before the, uh, from the felling of the tree, when the tree is cut down, to the time that it's cured for a while and that the artist could paint on. Now, of course, some trees, um, you know, they may be painted on a hundred years later uh, on the boards, but uh, certainly you can't paint on a tree that was felled, let's say in the 1480s if you died in the 1460s. So he thinks that this work was probably made in the 1490s. You know, it's spelled maybe 10 years before or so, which means that it cannot be by Roger van der Weyden. He died in 1464. The best idea of how it was made, this was made for, we call it the Muri Flores altar piece. It was for uh, a monastery. Uh, called the Muri Floris. And this it was what the, the king of Spain who was giving this. Uh, queen Isabella would have been his heir wanted to, to acquire that painting evidently but had a copy made for the monks. And that would have been around 1496. Who would she have gotten to copy this painting? Well, maybe one of her court painters, Juan de Flans. Juan de Flans, the name means John or Jan of Flanders. He was a Flemish artist. He was trained in the North and he came to Spain to be the court painter to Isabella of of Isabella the Catholic. And uh, this, of course, is Isabella who married Ferdinand and uh, they united uh, Aragon and Castile and uh, you know, united Spain. Um, they drove out the, um, the remainder of the Islamic, uh, the rulers of the Islamic kingdom. They united Spain. They made it a Christian country. Uh, and you may know about Isabella from uh, the Christopher Columbus story, uh, that she was the patron of uh, Christopher Columbus in his search for, well, he thought the Indies and turned out to be the New World. So, and there are other court painters. Uh, one that I'm very interested in is Michael Sitow, for example. Um, but this seems to be, it shows you that painters could used, say, their own styles, and then also they could very closely copy other artists, very skilled at that. And so we think now that this was probably copied by Juan de Flans for uh, Queen Isabella. Well, let's go back and look at the Muri Flores altarpiece, which today is in the museum, the Gamalda Galleria in Berlin. Uh, is now believed to be the original Roger van der Weyden painting. 
And you can see that they're dedicated to Mary. There's scenes of Mary and Christ on each panel. Uh, you can also see this motif that Roger Vanderwein develops of a archway through which we look and see the holy scene behind it. And on that archway, uh, he has painted carved stone uh, scenes as part of the archivolts or the, the voussoir, uh, and also, of course, uh, as jam statues on either side of this opening. And these all these uh, little stone carvings give you more of the story than you know what you're seeing right there. But the first one is with the infancy of Christ. It's a holy family. Uh, you have Mary and Saint Joseph adoring the Christ child seated on uh, Mary's lap. And I might point out to you that gesture that. Mary's using. You know, usually we think of Mary adoring the Christ child or anybody adoring or praying. Uh, they have their hands together pointed upward. Uh, this is a gesture that actually was used when uh, vassals would um, pledge their homage to their overlord. Say knights to their lord or a lord to their higher lord. Uh, and it became a, a prayer gesture uh, because you are pledging uh, and praying to uh, your what ultimate lord, uh, God. Well, Mary's hands are together, but they're not pointed upward. They're pointed toward the Christ child. And this was one of the inventions of Roger von der Weiden. Uh, the Christ child's small. You know, you go and you see these big figures. Uh, he's drawing your attention, both with the focus of their gaze, but also by the direction of Mary's hand. The, the eye is drawn to the Christ child. Now, you might notice that they're in a, what, some kind of building, uh, and they have a cloth of honor behind them. So this is not exactly a realistic image of what it would have been uh, you know, at the stable of the nativity or in the home of the carpenter. Uh, you know, it looks much more ecclesiastical and or even like a throne room. So, you know, when your mind is, this isn't just any old mother and child with the father. Uh, it is uh, the queen of heaven. The king of heaven is the child. Then you have in the center, you know, we've, we've marked for, uh, moved from the incarnation to uh, Christ's birth uh, and uh, when he is a child to the end of his life. He has died. He is shown in uh, a scene that is often called a pietà, uh, which is from an Italian word that means both pity and piety. And it's come to mean the scene when Mary is holding her son, Christ, dead after his ordeal on the cross, and she is holding him and kissing him and warning him. Uh, it's a kind of excerpted image from a scenes of the lamentation over the body of Christ. Instead of all of the figures, you have you know, Mary and Christ. Well, here we have two other figures as well. We have John the Evangelist and someone who, who is he? You know, is he... Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, perhaps, holding, supporting the head of Christ. Um, these were very, very popular images. The image of Mary holding her son, dead son, uh, in Germany and the Netherlands and uh, France and basically in, in Northern Europe. Uh, it was a Northern European idea that then uh, came to Italy and became very popular there. And you're probably familiar with Michelangelo's Pietà. Uh, but all those Northern images, uh, many of them you know, came first, as it were. Uh, you see a landscape going on in the background, gives us depth. And we see the cross of Christ in uh, a shape that uh, sort of mimics that shape that you see uh, with the uh, horizontal beam, uh, like the canopy over the cloth of honor in the picture of the Holy Family. We have this vertical and horizontal uh, motif that runs through all three panels. And of course, it's part of the cross of Christ in the center. You'll notice that Mary's garment is changing colors. Holy Family, she's wearing the white garment that St. Bridget said uh, Mary's wearing at the time of the birth of Christ. You know, her purity is emphasized. This virgin gave birth to a child. 
she's wearing red, which is not that common. Uh, usually Mary will be wearing blue and John will be wearing red, but he switched the colors. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense because that's the color of blood. It's also the color of love. So Mary, you know, is, is wearing that color um, of blood, of love uh, at the, for the Pieta, or for the mourning, the lamentation over the body of Christ. And then in the final, she's wearing her more traditional blue, uh, and Christ here is wearing the red, uh, switch, it's Christ appearing to his mother. What do you mean appearing to his mother? Appearing to his mother after the resurrection. You might say, well, that's not in the Bible. No, it's not. Uh, the Bible tells us of various people seeing Christ after his resurrection. It does not say that Christ came to Mary, his mother. He, he appears to Mary Magdalene. He, uh, there are the, what, the women who come to the tomb and find it empty. Actually, he's appearing to Mary Magdalene. Uh, he appears to the apostles in the upper room. But once again, Christians couldn't imagine that Christ would not have appeared to his mother, perhaps first. So he's come back from the dead. He's holding up his hands to show her the wounds. In other words, I really died. I have the wounds. And I'm back. I've come back to life. I've been resurrected. And Mary's holding up her hands too, you know, in, in amazement. <laughs> uh, as we look through the window, uh, we see the three holy women uh, you know, approaching the empty tomb. So we see some of the biblical images in the background, the, the, the biblical story, the way the story is told. Uh, but we're seeing that uh, idea of uh, God, Christ's love for his mother uh, appearing in the idea of uh, he appears to her after the resurrection. Okay, uh, there is another painting like that where there's two versions which is uh, the St. John the Baptist altarpiece. You have uh, three panels, and you can see they're all the same size, just like the Mary Flores altarpiece. So this would have been made to be um, hang open. It doesn't hinged and it doesn't uh, necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily have that to, to hinge and be closed. Um, the you have three scenes. Once again, you have this archway, in this case, you know, a little pointed arch uh, and uh, a sort of almost like a facade of a church, which very frequently would have three archways leading into uh, the nave or the nave and the side aisles. Um, and you have that idea, once again, of repeating scenes that embellish, that tell you more about the story that is being shown uh, below. There's one version in Berlin, which is the one I'm showing you, and there is another version uh, in Frankfurt. The first scene, oh, first, I'll just name them all. First is the uh, birth of the Baptist and the naming of the Baptist. And then there is uh, John the Baptist is baptizing Christ. And there is the death of John the Baptist, where he is being decapitated. You'll notice in all of these that uh, some of the main figures stand outside the doorway. And then we look through and see more of the room beyond the doorway or the landscape beyond the doorway. So this, you know, puts the figure, the closer, the uh, holy figures closer to you, as it were. You know, there's not that barricade of the, uh, the doorway. Okay, let's look at the first scene. This shows you John the Baptist has just been born. His mother is lying in bed. She's being tended, presumably, by a midwife. And her husband, Zachariah, is writing on a piece of paper. He's sort of right outside the room. And there's a woman holding the baby. Who is that woman? Well, this is kind of unusual, but you remember that the Virgin Mary, when she found out she was pregnant with Christ child, went to visit her sister Elizabeth. 
It doesn't tell us when she went home. Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist. So the assumption is that Mary stayed to assist at Elizabeth's uh, childbirth. And this is the Virgin Mary who is holding the infant Saint John. She at the time is pregnant with the Christ child. And she's showing him to his father. Now, why is Zacharias writing something? Well, the story was that uh, John the Baptist's birth was really a, a kind of a miraculous birth. Elizabeth was very old. She didn't think she could bear children anymore. Presumably she thought she was postmenopausal. Um, and you know, Zacharias expresses his disbelief that she could be pregnant, uh, and uh, he's struck dumb. So when the Virgin Mary is bringing him his son to be named. So this is the naming of the John, John the Baptist. He writes the name that he wants his son to have, John. Now, whatever it would have been in Hebrew or in Aramaic. Uh, and uh, then he can speak. <laughs> the center has Christ right in the center. And it shows you John the, Bapti John the Baptist baptizing Christ. And of course, the words coming down from heaven uh, you know, and the dove coming down from heaven uh, with God's words, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Traditionally, uh, there are many images of, of the uh, baptism of Christ, and they often show uh, an angel or angels who are holding his robe, standing on the uh, bank of the River Jordan. And here, of course, we see the river uh, wending its way uh, back through this distant landscape. The decapitation of John the Baptist. Uh, that strange image of the uh, executioner. It looks like he's losing his clothes. Uh, presumably, he's you know, taken his doublet or his uh, jerkin and he's uh, pulled it back so it won't get all bloody when he cuts off the head of John the Baptist. Uh, he also has this very awkward position, you know, the sort of one leg stuck out, the other one foreshortened, and then uh, his head, body's going one way and his head's twisting out, so he's looking away. Like, I don't want to face what I just did. <laughs> um, but he has just cut off the head of John the Baptist, and we see the blood spurting from the wound in the neck. And he places the head of the Baptist uh, on a platter. And the lovely young lady who is standing there receiving this dish uh, of uh, John the Baptist's head on a platter is Salome. And so we want to talk about her story. Uh, you can see it in the background. You see the Feast of Herod. Now, what had happened was that John the Baptist was preaching these fiery sermons and calling people to repentance. And he also took on the king, King Herod. Uh, Herod ruled uh, as a subject king uh, for Rome. And he had done some things that John the Baptist considered to be absolutely immoral. He had married his brother's wife. Now, there is a rule in the Bible that says if your brother dies without issue, which doesn't seem to be the case here, uh, you should then marry your brother's wife and her first child will be called your child. You know, a way to carry on the line in a sense. But um, that's not what was going on, evidently. Um, Herod married Herodotus. No, Herodias. Uh, and she already had a daughter by her previous husband, and that was Salome. Uh, and at the Feast of Herod, uh, Her uh, Salome does a dance for the uh, guests. And Herod is much taken with this dance. Now, in the 19th century, they, they have this, like, belly dancer, shedding veils is what they think of. But in the 15th century, it's a very decorous dance. And uh, the Bible doesn't tell us how old Salome was. You know, was she a child? You know, uh, just sort of showing off for 
you know, the family, or uh, you know, was she older? Uh, but uh, she shows you shown as a young woman. And uh, I always assumed that Herod was in his cups, as they say, when he said, uh, you know, he loved the dance so much, he was going to give her anything she asked for. And I suppose he thought she'd ask for, you know, a new dress or beautiful piece of jewelry, or if she is a child, maybe a doll, uh, whatever, you know, something like that. Uh, he didn't think it through. She could have asked him, you know, even if it's half my kingdom, did he really want to give that away? Uh, but uh, she goes to her mother, which always suggests to me that she's fairly young. And she says to her mother, what should I ask for? And her mother says, the head of John the Baptist. Well, John had been preaching against the king. He had been saying that he and his wife were living in sin. And, you know, he's denouncing the ruling family uh, of Judea. Uh, and so they had him imprisoned. So he's handy to have his head cut off. Uh, and Herodias does not like someone saying that she's living an immoral lifestyle. Uh, and uh, you know, bad, bad mouthing her to all the people, so um, you know her remedy is to have him silenced forever. Well, kings can't say things like "I'll give you everything, anything you want," and then say, "Oh no, I didn't mean that." And maybe he really did want John dead. After all, he didn't really want somebody preaching against him. So he gives the order, and here we can see the result of that order. Um, keep in mind that backwards figure of the executioner. You'll see one that's influenced by him, by Roger van der Weyden, again. It's a popular way to show the executioner. Okay, we, we said that Roger van der Weyden went down to Rome. Um, there is a reference that he looked at some paintings uh, by Gentili uh, da Fabriano, which were in Rome. The paintings, alas, do not exist anymore, and admired them. The year was 1450. We said it was a jubilee year in which your pilgrimage to Rome would earn indulgences. Now, one of the interesting things is we don't see a change in Roger's style. He doesn't try to start painting like Gentile de Fabriano or any of the other 15th century artists. But we do see some compositional things that suggest that he was in Florence. So he must have gone through Florence, either coming or going or both. And it looks like he has looked at some paintings by Fra Angelico. Now, some of you know who Fra Angelico was. He was a uh, Dominican friar or monk. Uh, he was in the monastery of San Marco in Venice, and he and uh, his workshop painted uh, scenes of the life of Christ in the various cells of the monastery. And of course, some were also on the wall outside the cells, and there's another one that's downstairs. He painted the altarpiece for the church uh, that's attached to the monastery. Uh, so, you know, Fran, it, basically the Monastery of San Marco today is a Fra Angelico Museum. Uh, and it was a, uh, the monastery was uh, patronized by the Medici. We have several paintings by Roger van der Weyden that seem to have been influenced by his trip to Italy. Uh, they show a, a kind of Florentine connection. This is sometimes called the Medici Madonna because we believe that it was made for the Medici. And you can see the style is, is purely Northern. It's a, you know, Roger van der Weyden's own style of the figures becoming somewhat more elongated as time goes by. Um, and so, you know, he could have painted this, you know, did he stay in Florence and paint it for a while? Or did he go back uh, to his workshop in Brussels and then ship it to, uh, to uh, 
Florence? Well, you know, we don't know. Uh, but it seems to have been painted for the Medici. And the reason we say that is because of uh, two of the saints who are here. Uh, you have, as you can see on one side, St. Peter and St. John uh, the Baptist. Uh, and then in the center, Mary and the Christ child. And they have a kind of tent or a baldachin, a little canopy over her head uh, with the, the uh, veils or the... Uh, draperies that go down the front are being held up by uh, these uh, monochromatic angels. And on the right side, you have two saints who are physician saints. This is Cosimo and Damien. Uh, the name Medici means physician. Of course, the Medici at this time were uh, international bankers. Uh, but the family name uh, came from these two physician saints, Cosimo and Damien. And so that suggests that perhaps it was a Medici commission. Uh, the other thing that suggests Florence is you can see down at the bottom they have these uh, shields and in the center is a fleur de -lis. Now we think of the fleur de -lis as being France and it is. Uh, but Sometimes the same emblem is used by different people. And the fleur de -lis was also used by Florence, which is, its name is the City of Flowers, Firenze. So this also was an insignia uh, that combined with Cos Cosimo and Damien uh, suggests the possibility that this was made uh, for the Medici. Now here is one of the examples that really very clearly shows us that Roger van der Weyden was in Italy, that he must have seen uh, this painting by Fra Angelico. It's an entombment, although it's often given the name the farewell at the tomb, because it's an entombment where Christ has not yet been laid in the tomb, but where one figure or more than one figure is holding Christ up for our adoration. And Mary on one side, uh, St. John on the other, are you know, holding his hands, perhaps kissing his hands, uh, you know, paying their last respects before they lay him in the tomb. And you know, this is a very unique way of showing the entombment. And so we see it here with uh, just uh, Christ and three figures right before a rocky outgrowth, uh, a rocky cliff. Uh, and then within the tomb, this rock cut tomb, is a sarcophagus. And the lid of the sarcophagus, or the stone of unction, is uh, stretched out uh, in front, so kind of a recession into depth as we're you know, looking backward into uh, the pain. And so Christ is stretched out sort of in the shape of a cross. You know, normally Christ is being laid in the tomb. You know, it would be horizontal to the picture plane and the body would be held over the uh, tomb. You remember the Serlin um, entombment by Robert Campine. So as I say, it's a very unique composition. And so Roger van der Weyden seemed to have borrowed and embellished on it. He has the element of uh, someone uh, and here it is both Nicodemus and John, and both Nicodemus. It is both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea who is holding the uh, the body of Christ. Uh, it still is Mary on one side and John on the other, holding the hands. But here we also have an added element of Mary Magdalene kneeling, and then the tomb is in a. Uh, the edge of a cliff. In Roger van der Weyden's case, the uh, top of it seems to have uh, some moss or grass growing on it, and uh, we can see further into the distance with the landscape. But it's a very similar rectangular opening with a sarcophagus, and then the stone of unction coming outward, but here at an angle, rather than you know, leading directly to us. But I think that you know it clearly shows the kind of thing that he was doing. Um, what he did with things that he learned in Italy was not to change his style, uh, but to borrow some compositional elements and then uh, embellish upon them. <laughs>